Um, you know, a lot of us in the blockchain space and people that I've been collaborating with over uh, this past few years, or I guess uh, really just a year, it feels like a lifetime. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, we have um, kind of gotten into these different patterns of connecting together at conferences and, you know, creating opportunities for um, working together in real life, you know, building things at hackathons that end up, um, you know, becoming real and becoming, you know, projects that are a major point of focus, uh, such as, um, you know, when I met Kay <laughs> and, uh, you know, having these kind of collaboration points like Koala that are end up being a physical instantiation of, you um, you know, discussions that end up going along in uh, digital space. And, you know, right now we're at this uh, interesting point that, you know, even before um, the COVID crisis started happening, um, you know, earlier this year, then where a lot of us had been like, you know, are we really doing this, um, you know, handling, oops, uh, handling these um, ways of engaging with each other in a way that's sustainable and in terms of, you um, you know, being kind to the environment in terms of being, you know, sustainable over time as people uh, struggle with, um, you know, having like uh, projects that, you know, bring us together in different time zones, et cetera. You know, what does it actually mean to have um, this, and, you know, also as different projects end up having different levels of funding as uh, token strategies end up not working out in the, uh, you know, exciting way that <laughs> we had thought that they might, um, you know, as there ends up being these shifting legal boundaries that make certain things more challenging than we had hoped. And also as we're learning from the process of co-creating, um, you know, governance structures and, you know, dog fooding our own stuff and the term that, you know, has come up again and again and, um, you know, has, I think, resulted in some challenges. <laughs> so anyway, so what I had hoped to do in this discussion was, uh, you know, step away from talking at people and see what uh, approaches people are taking, you know, what are some of the concerns that are happening, um, you know, that we are dealing with now. And, um, you know, so before I get started, since we don't have very many people, which is uh, perfect for the structure of this discussion, if, you um, I think in this interface, people are also able to talk. So if everyone could just share a little bit, um, you know, just kind of what's the perspective, you know, that you are coming from and, um, you know, kind of either what projects you're working on or just where you have been in the space. Um, so we can, I can kind of figure out which direction to go with this discussion because there's several possibilities. So I see Grace, if Grace would be down to go first. <laughs> Cool. Can can people also turn on their cameras so that we can kind of be more friendly if this is going to be a more friendly format? I mean, if you don't want, this is recorded to YouTube. So if anybody doesn't, we won't be offended. We understand that a lot of people are really privacy yeah. oriented. Or if you're, you know, still in PJs and don't want to be seen or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, if, if you're put on cameras, that would be great. I want this to be, um, you know, uh, intimate discussion. So. Yeah, I just had lunch, so I might have salad in my teeth, but I don't think the res resolution is is high enough for that uh, problem to show up. So I'm um, I'm Grace. I work about half time at Holochain, um, and I got into this space because I'm very interested in governance systems. And one of the things that's become more and more apparent to me is um, that our dependence on money is a is a problem because the rules of the money game are, uh, they're fixed and set and it's kind of a rigged game and it's rigged against most of humanity. And um, a lot of the things we've been taught about money are, you know, they're kind of brainwashing that makes us think that it's a fair game, but it's not. There's just rules of the game that make it not a fair game. And that's my interest when we talk about ecosystems is starting to look at how can we change the rules of the game around money given that we are in an industry where we could redefine currency and my my concern around that is how do we create really truly sustainable ecosystems right what is an ecosystem means that you know what somebody some some entity excretes the other person the other entity eats or sustains itself from and I feel like we don't have enough 
sustenance for the humans in the system. Like Beth alluded to that with the financing. And so I feel like we need ways to think about our sustenance differently than it has to come from money. Um, that's where I'm coming from. And I'm going to pass it on to David HQ. Or, Hey, um, I wasn't expecting. I wasn't expecting this. I was just uh, chatting. Um, yeah, so I'm um, kind of an early adopter of. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So I was active in the beginning a little bit more. Then I had uh, two kids in the meantime, but now I'm slowly getting back. But I'm also interested in more in the intersection of uh, various uh, disciplines so not just uh, blockchain but of course we're, can you hear? We're, here, we're all hearing each other and we're hearing you but you're not hearing us beth can you just refresh you just go ahead and refresh yourself beth that might fix it uh go ahead david it works for you yeah, we can hear you all fine. Okay, so I, I was saying that um, I was active in the beginning more, um, but uh, now in the meantime, as much as I could, I followed uh, some IoT and also now VR. So I think there is some interesting uh, possible intersections and uh, how to say convergence of these technologies. For example, various virtual worlds, uh, worlds uh, and economies and everything. And I, I want to see what's available uh, now with some things and also develop as much as I um, can because of real life as well. So it, it's challenging because so many interesting things happening and um, it's, it, it, uh, it's wise to choose what this limited time is spent on. I'm a developer and at the moment I don't have uh, like pressing mon monetary issues but this could also happen within a year or two um, because of early adopt being an early adopter i had some resources invested in some like real estate and trying to make some tourism of of this but also it would be like educational tourism it would be a blockchain propaganda in in this uh, in the summer um that's the idea but now everything it it stretched out a little bit so at the moment i will just uh, enjoy this year working with whatever I uh, want and uh, later there will be time for some worry if, if if that happens hopefully not and this kind of conferences are great um, for me uh, especially because I live in some uh, smaller town in Slovenia and now uh, I kind of felt a little bit isolated in the past year but Virus is not great, but this is cool, like more online uh, meetings, so less travel and it fits, fits me personally, but yeah, that's that's it for, for me. For now. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> and yeah, sorry about the confusion with the sound, but it seems to be okay now. Um, cool. Um, I guess. I can go next. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, so for me, it's... Uh, very much about experimentation, like uh, I designing new socioeconomic systems, uh, new ways of relating to each other, um, finding where we can redesign the system uh, and and reconfigure, as Grace was saying, the rigged system. Because we, as we dive deeper in, we find out more and more uh, that the system is kind of stacked against us in that sense. And there's this mass awakening happening at the moment that I think it's really important to seize on. Uh, that's I work on a project called Metagame, and we're kind of creating this gamified layer two for reality. Um, and but it's mostly about community. You know, it's about people coming together and building things that help the community and that we all benefit from. So how do we create positive sum value games? How do we incentivize people, reward them for the work they do, um, create ecosystems that are able to source from within um, and share all the information and learnings in a collaborative way that moves us forward as like 
uh, society and uh, humanity in the direction of like creating sustainable um, planet to live on because the way things are set up now is a, a little bit crazy, uh, a little bit completely unsustainable. Uh, we know that things are going to collapse in no amount of time. And it's quite interesting, actually, like the outbreaks of situations we're seeing happening around the world that a lot of people are freaking out. But I think a lot of us who are in this bubble, I would say, are more like doubling down, right? The, what we're doing now is more important than ever right now, especially because um, when these things clear up, people are going to need new systems, new tools. They're going to need things that are reliable um, and will be there, right? Uh, we're here right now, like doing conferences like this, things that keep us connected and keep us uh, tuned in and learning. Um, so yeah, that's why, that's what's my background, why I'm here. And uh, thanks Beth for, uh, for coming here and sharing this question. <laughs> awesome, well, great perspective. And I've been hearing some really cool stuff about metagames. So when we get more into strategy sharing, I really look forward to hearing um, what you guys are getting up to. Definitely. Um, uh, all right, how about uh, Cyprian? Hopefully I pronounced your name right. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's just that everyone's sleeping at home, so. <laughs> oh, no, I mean, no worries if you don't want to sleep, because I know the feeling. <laughs> all right, um, so on my side, I am the uh, uh, head of product and uh, crypto economics um, at a stealth startup. Uh, which, is going, which is going to launch in the next few months. Um, we do. We are building like a, a movie. You can basically watch movies with your friend, like in a Twitch kind of way. Um, so the idea is like we are all participating into the platform, and when you organize an event where people can watch together that movie, you get paid in coins to do that. Um, okay, cool. I mean, that sounds uh, very interesting. So. Uh, thank you for uh, hoping, uh, risking waking people up <laughs> to share. So, um, okay, cool. I see, um, I guess maybe if we can just go down in this, uh, the, the order of this thing. So um, I think I can't see what some people's names are, but uh, Stefan? Yes, hi. Um, yeah, I'm active in the blockchain space for quite some time now and working mostly on ether risk, um, decentralized insurance on the blockchain. And um, before that, I, I used to do some educational stuff and I, I used to work for a large Swiss bank um, on crypto innovation. And um, before that, I, I was a teacher and, and software developer. And my main interest is in, in how we can apply this technology um, in a good way yeah? and and how we can kind of trigger some necessary social change and and yeah thinking about money and and how money holds this um, current system together is um, is actually a good start and and i think um, we have we had some discussions about this in the last days and um, i think as a community, we we have a much better understanding of what money is and and how money works um, than many others uh, around us. Um, so we should we should apply that. Uh, oops, I keep forgetting to turn my microphone back on. Um, <laughs> yeah, awesome. So. Um... I guess, uh, okay, since we have more people here than when we originally started sharing, I don't wanna take up too much time, but also, um, you know, if anyone is down to actively participate in the discussion, uh, maybe if a few more people could kind of share where you're coming from and then we'll go into talking. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, feel free to just unmute yourself and go ahead and start, introduce yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hi, this is Angela. Hi, Beth. Hi. Hello. Nice to have you. <laughs> I just bumped in. I, I don't switch off uh, on my camera because I'm still wearing my pajama. But <laughs> it's a very nice conversation going on at the moment. So thank you. I, uh, I just wanted to share um, 
what we what our topic was over the last weeks, let's say, for token engineering. I mean, um, since this is about ecosystems, um, I think what's really interesting, or what uh, was something that that I'm working on, is how to how to really find those web three business models and sustainability models for ecosystem in terms of funding mainly, because I see a certain risk that we will have funding for public goods at the protocol level. So the, the infrastructure, like we already see it today, the product, protocols trying to find ways to fund their ecosystem via grants, via prices. Um, uh, also, um, Bitter Cartel Ventures is a, a super exciting new initiative. And at, at the, so good, but at the same time, we see for the application layer, um, people are developing very typical web two business models, which in a way, I think we still need to sort out because, um, the grants uh, and the amounts that are offered there and the capabilities of the protocols are also limited, especially uh, today. And so what's the future here? And so my concern is a little bit that we are just building let's say I'm exaggerating here, but uh, we are building a brilliant new decentralized infrastructure to make Web2 even more successful, efficient and dynamic, right? So having the, the typical value extraction at the application layer. And, very well said. <laughs> I mean, this would be really a pity. So I don't want to look back to this time and then said, yeah, actually we did the, we did just make it more powerful. And uh, for my talk, I analyzed DeFi because it's like a big MVP experiment at the moment. You have a very simple value proposition, which is borrowing and lending at the core. Mm -hmm. And But under the hood, of course, a lot of experiments on the mechanism design, on how to make it a decentralized model. And so we could learn a lot. And what's really interesting there is that you can have similar mechanisms. You have uh, different components for achieving the same goal. So it's kind of a perfect case to apply an engineering process, building models and then comparing different components. But then again, the question is the models should be a common good, right? We should share those models because it makes us faster and um, make, make the results more, what is actually built more reliable and stable. And then the question is again, how to fund this, how to create this, and make it, um, yeah, make make this a common good, very similar to protocol. So the engineering layer, a, pro, uh, a common good, and how could funding look like? And so yellow, I'm, I'm really maybe uh, this is also something where we could have a discussion on uh, meta game ideas, meta cartel venture ideas, token engineering ideas, how to how to achieve that. Oh yeah, I'm, oh, I'm down for that. <laughs> Yeah. Um, okay, well, yeah, we'll revisit that in just a few minutes when we get into talking about strategies. And um, Angela touched on something that I'm especially excited about right now, which is this, um, you know, it's been really fascinating with the current crisis to watch kind of discussions emerge at scale and throughout the general population, looking at models and like understanding, you know, the fact that models can be manipulated, models, you know, can potentially be used for prediction, but also, you know, come with these different flaws. But, you know, I never would have, you know, thought that we would be seeing this population among, you know, our parents, random people looking at uh, graphs and like, okay, how do we understand this curve? What can we do to like directly interact with this model to like change what the outcome of it will be? So um, this concept of um, kind of creating systems for modeling as a common good, you know, I think that we are at a point where um, a discussion can be accelerated about that that we never even would have dreamed of before. So yeah, we'll definitely go into that um, shortly. <laughs> and uh, okay, I see, um, wait, I can't tell what your name is from this, but uh, SA. <laughs> um, see, all right, or Reem. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi, Beth. <laughs> Long time no see. Um, hi, I'm not necessarily involved in the blockchain crypto space. I've been kind of tangentially in that space for the last 
five, six years. Um, I used to live in DC where I used to manage the DC blockchain meetup and then moved to Berlin about a year ago and kind of dipped my toes in the blockchain space, but I've been primarily a product designer for analytics and artificial intelligence um, pri products and um, data analytics and data visualization, which is something I've been trying to bring over to the blockchain space. Um, I mean, blockchain technology, um, the protocols, they're all fascinating. But I mean, one thing that I've been fighting for since DC is the taking a human centric approach to, you know, you have this cool tech, but you don't have a problem that you're solving it for. Why do you think anyone's going to want to use blockchain or how is this useful? What problem are you addressing? So that's kind of the role that I've been playing in the space and even had a podcast for last six months about it called blocked by design um right now considering covid and all it's been a little um um we kind of put it on the back burner but um yeah beth invited me to join to kind of dip my toes back into the blockchain space so thank you for inviting me um Awesome. Well, thank you so much. So I think maybe if we're able to hear from uh, one more person and then can get into chatting, um, I think is Anya in here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, you were <are> saying <laughs> it's showing up like that. Anyways. <laughs> Wait, do you need me to say something or? Oh, oh, if you just wanted to intro a little bit about what you are doing with Future Law and especially the discussion, you know, like interdisciplinary discussions we've been having and some of the ecosystem work that you're doing, if you're uh, willing to talk about it a little bit, would be awesome. Sure, absolutely. Um, okay, so the Future Law Collaborative, um, the idea was out there almost like a year ago already. Um, and one of them was not only to have a collaboration of um, lawyers worldwide in working within different jurisdictions, but also to kind of have a virtual summit um, of all of them. But to be honest, in December or October last year, a lot of people were just saying, you know, oh, does it really make sense to have a virtual summit? And <laughs> nobody was really into it that much because we prefer the personal touch. We prefer the reality. Absolutely. Um, but then when COVID arrived, then um, we kind of had to switch everything upside down. And right now, I think that um, a lot of people are making the moves making the waves. Um, we've started creating this collaborative a bit differently. So we really um, made some actions, action plans um, and a timeline. There is a notion and on the notion, there is a huge database of all the legal measures, pretty much the response measures that countries are taking. Um, we're also looking into focusing on different areas rather than just their jurisdictions, because um, there's quite a lot of measures that countries are taking with regard to the surveillance. Um, and we're really trying to have an overview of what is happening from a legal aspect, um, all together being done uh, with a narrative that we kind of have um, this opportunity to flip the power dynamics that we are seeing in the world. So it's no longer just the governments, it's also that a lot of um, private um, actors are becoming almost like a regulators. So you can see that Facebook, Google, um, Pinterest, Instagram, WhatsApp, all these, um, even Zoom, <laughs> all these private sectors are um, taking some actions and are becoming more and more political. Um, and we are kind of being censored or controlled or, you know, our reality is pretty much being narrated by them as well. So we're trying to keep track on that. Um, and if anybody wants to join, please welcome. Um, there is like an application through Typeform. We're creating this whole database together. And I think that this, we can definitely help each other out in times like this. And basically, probably this is not going to be the only epidemic. So let's build a better preparedness plan. That's the bottom line idea. Definitely. And I'm also really excited about the, you know, possible intersections with what Angela was talking about with, um, you know, what does it mean to uh, have ways of kind of modeling and simulating um, as a common good and what you guys are doing, which is mm -hmm. assembling the, um, foundation for that actually being useful as a common good, which is, um, you know, a decentralized peer to peer database. So very mm -hmm. cool facilities there. <laughs> um, and, you know, I know less about metagame, but I can also see, you know, what you guys are doing intersecting in an interesting way, which is, um, you know, kind of galvanizing a community at scale for participating in that stuff. So anyways, I think a lot of intersection points. Um, 
So to get into discussing, this is a you know phrase that I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with. Uh, Audrey Lord's uh, the master the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. You know something that has resonated with me throughout working in blockchain because of this constant give and take that we experience with um, you know wanting to create new tools, wanting to create new frameworks for organizing, and um, you know even you know new models for coming together and, you know, like what we're doing right now with, um, you know, being very open to experimentation for ways of collaborating. And yet again, the, you know, kind of traditional problems of society end up plaguing us and emerging. And so this um, kind of paradox has, you know, been just an interesting thing to observe. And I think Right now, uh, we are at a time where the master's house is getting dismantled by outside forces and we can kind of decide which tools to use. So, um, and you know, whether we want to wield these tools in different ways than before and just, you know, what is currently working. So this is one uh, kind of line of thought that has been inspiring me. And another one is from the title of this talk, uh, talk this idea of the edge of chaos, which, um, you know, in chaos theory and systems theory is this uh, particular place that's very fertile for adaptation, you know, a, um, you know, a point between chaos and order where um, uh, a system is adapting for uh, adaptation itself, you know, is um, because it's a point of constant change and um, specifically, you know, a state of becoming from how the system was before entering into a necessary chaos and emerging with a new order, then, um, you know, this is the point where we get to decide, like, what are we adapting for? Like, what are the traits that, you know, we want to carry over? What are the things that we want to shed? Like, what do we want the contours of our new forms to look like? And so that's, you know, kind of where I'm coming from. So I have just a few questions and, you know, I don't think we have that much time, um, but, you know, if we get started talking through these and this is a discussion that I'm very interested in continuing and have been having with a lot of you guys in different forms. So I was hoping to have this just kind of be a fishbowl that can bring us together for talking about this stuff in a lens of the current situation and, you know, we can go forward from there. So, you know, in this idea of thinking, you know, what are we adapting for and how are we adapting? Then um, I think we touched on this a little bit with the intros and this overarching meta question that's happening with this conference of, um, you know, how can we transfer the benefits that we have of, you know, engaging in meet space <laughs> um, at conferences and in the hallway track, et cetera, for, um, you know, still coming together and in a situation where we're first forced to be virtual. So, and also, you know, which parts of the system um, are, you know, have we identified as being super important to maintain? Like what has ended up being kind of a painful challenge as we uh, try to figure out how to go forward, especially in the topic that Angela was mentioning with, um, you know, creating tangible paths for funding. So if anyone would um, like to share a little bit about, um, you know, either how the projects you're working with are adapting to this, how you are creating a solution, like what are some of the pain points that you um, are adapting for or away from, <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, I can start uh, really quick. Um, so. Metagame is, um, has been working on kind of developing a scalable value attribution mm, system for our contributors. We want to reward people and we use the, our native seed token, which is an ERC20 token. Uh, but the thing, the problem is we don't want it to be limited to people who are capable of using like smart contract wallets and things like that. We want people who can do writing and memes and all kinds of things to be able to do it. So we're working with a team called uh, SourceCred and SourceCred is a modified page rank algorithm. You might know about it. Uh, yeah. Fascinating project, amazing people. Um, so we've integrated SourceCred into uh, a discourse where we do our public forums uh, into our discord where all of our communications happen. And then also into GitHub, which is where it's most active, I would say. And that helps us to keep track of like who's contributing what and how their contributions is mo are most valuable. Because I think that something that goes by the wayside, especially in like technology focused projects is 
contributions that have no that don't go in github you know that aren't tech it's like not it's oftentimes that the the technology is what's um professed as the most valuable thing but the the communities behind the technology are as equally powerful and are as, as big a motivators for people and so metagame is our, our community is everything the people who are there whether they're like writing the bots for uh you know engaging in different platforms or whether they're like building the actual metagame mechanism it's like we want people to be able to um interface and have their value contributed and tracked everywhere that they work so we've been working with that team to do that because we uh feel like it's the best path forward at the moment um DAOs don't feel very user friendly they don't feel like an easy way for people to come in and say oh sure i'll just uh sign up for my metamask and vote a proposal up on chain like it's just you get lost in the noise and i think we need to like lower the bar for entry into this space and we hope to do that for ethereum we want to be an onboarding engine for ethereum and that's what we're working on so what are some of the use cases that you guys are working toward? Um, so, I mean, I've been like super involved in the DAO space in the past year and have, you know, obviously noticed, noticed a lot of the same issues, you know, that you um, are mentioning in terms of onboarding, accessibility, et cetera. So, um, you know, kind of the two questions that I have from, you know, listening about that are actually three. One is, you know, where are people able to get funding for um, contributing this work and how are, uh, you know, how specifically does using the attribution models of source cred, um, like enable adapting for better um, ways of accessing that funding? And the other one is, you know, what are the kind of contributions that people are making and what is their incentive to participate in that? Uh-oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, I muted myself. Yeah. I might have to ask you the last question again before I get through all of them. but. The first question, um, how are we looking for funding or how are um, we funding contributors in who are working on metagame? Uh, the latter, but also the former, if you want to share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, currently we have Gitcoin grants up, uh, which has been a good thing for us. The Meta Cartel is a very tight knit community. Um, we mobilize really, I I'm a member of the Meta Cartel. The Meta Cartel is another DAO. And we are able to uh, do pretty well, like arbitraging uh, and like coordinating to get everyone to vote and with their die to support certain projects. So we did quite well on the first round of funding. Awesome. Um, and it's it's interesting though because there's some things happening there that we're also like looking into on a deeper level oh, that yeah. <laughs> don't add, that don't add up. But we'll leave that for another, <laughs> another discussion. Um, and so we are actually working with um, a couple different DAO frameworks. We work with uh, Aragon at the moment because honestly, they've been the most involved and the most excited about pushing metagame forward. Um, a lot of the members of Aragon are have been like kind of co-founding, helping metagame get rolling, get off the ground, and like set up what's called a seed market. And the seed market is our um, token on a bonding curve. And so what that would allow projects and people to do is to fund uh, initiatives that they want to see built inside of metagame. So it could be um, different projects or different initi initiatives to actually push metagame forward, or it could be other projects who want to source um, from inside of metagame and they want to pay with seeds. So they could, there's, there's a metric, I can't explain it to you in detail at the moment, it would take a long time, but we have a really nice blog post about how the seed market works. But there's um, a way for projects to buy seed and then fund their own initiatives, um, which would actually uh, fund the people inside Metagame and keep the token value at a reasonable number. So that's something we're working on deploying right now in collaboration with Aragon. And then we're also doing some experiments with Colony just, for, uh, just to like keep it branched out as much as possible and to keep the experimentation flowing. So yeah, those, the, for now we've got um, those two funding sources. Um, we, the contributors are, who have earned seed, their value will get set when the seed market launches and we'll be funding our own market with all of the funds that we've raised so far from these grant rounds. 
Um, okay, what was your next question? Yeah, so I think that's very exciting. And I know that, you know, there's been a lot of need for that work in the space and a lot of people galvanized around doing, you know, kind of iterations of that. So I'm really excited to see, you know, hopefully you guys going forward. Um, but I was also wondering, you know, what are the kind of contributions that people are making, you know, from the ecosystem perspective, like what, you know, how are you guys onboarding people? What um, incentivizes people to get involved and like stay involved in a way of meaningful contributions? Yeah, so um, the way that people come into metagame is they read like our founding articles. We have these like eight pillar articles and we actually, so it's like, it's uh, based on a quest system. So we ask people to complete quests and then we uh, upgrade their roles once they are in and in means like in discord. So different levels um, of contribution will give you different levels of access. And so it's like kind of incentivized. The more that you learn, the more that you like a become involved and b uh, become indoctrinated. We might say like you read everything that we've that we've written and read all the posts and and what we're trying to do and what we want to accomplish with this community. And people really kind of rally behind the message because it's a lot bigger than make money or just make cool tech. Like we want to change the entire system right we want to flip it on top of its head we want to like unite people from around the world uh we want to bring people together in a um, uh, non-coercive way that allows them to work on things they're passionate about and get funded for that uh but this phase one of that is to build metagame so like you work for metagame building metagame so that one day other people can build the things they're interested in and use this tool but now we, we only have this, we only have working on a metagame as the, as the thing, right? Because we need to focus on this and make sure it's robust and that it works. Um, so yeah, that's like phase one. And there's many, like five phases of this whole thing. But once people read through the articles, they're either in or out. They're either like, this is something I'm excited about and I want to help with. Or they're like, no, this is not something I'm interested in. You know, I have other things to focus on. And, and we kind of like that because it allows for a level of interest and involvement that's very highly aligned from the beginning. So they move through the first few quests and then they start to like, we call it go rogue, where they just find things that they find valuable. And if the community also finds those things valuable, they will be uh, minted rewards through the source cred system that then um, pays them for that work. But we, no one tells anyone what to do. Uh, we just make issues in GitHub sometimes. People pick up initiatives, they run with them. Uh, it's 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 very like do come here and do what you think you can do best and if you do it best and the community also is excited about that you'll be rewarded for that uh, you, you, using the source code system yeah so i think that's very valuable and like thank you you know for sharing about that but just to kind of draw back to a more abstract level um you know i think uh, I would love to hear from also, you know, either Angela or Anya kind of about, you know, these same questions, like what, um, you know, what, like, with the work that, um, you know, you're doing with token engineering and with DGov and with future law, um, as well, you know, like very analogous communities in many ways in terms of, um, you know, people making significant contributions and like us working toward, um, you know, this goal of like sustainable foundation of research, et cetera. Oh yeah. Oh, also um, I'd love to hear from Grace who has been very involved in all of these things together. Um, I don't know how to like enable you speaking, but you should. Oh yeah. We just don't need ourselves. So yeah. I kind of want to, I want to say something about um, what I'm adapting from specifically and what i'm trying to adapt from is is actually money and financial systems and i'm also adapting from euphemisms like saying value when i mean money because money doesn't but it's really true right like i love air and money fundamentally <laughs> the forms of money we have are anti-air and blockchains are even more anti-air than other forms of money so I'm trying to adapt away from money. Now, this is not easy. Um, and I'm not uh, financially independent, but I, but I sense that 
our monetary systems are in such disarray and despair that it doesn't make sense to be adapting for money. So that doesn't mean I don't, there's certain services, when I do services in the old economy, which is about half of my work, I do ask for monetary compensation like I always have. But in this space, I've stopped. And I think I'm going to put up a tip jar or something like that because my sense is I, what I'm trying to adapt for is a Star Trek economy. I'm going to call it that. But I know there's enough food for everybody. I know there's enough shelter for everybody. I know that transacting for our basic needs doesn't make any sense. Whatever food I have, I should share with my neighbors if they're hungry. But that's just, and my neighbors could be anybody in the world. I, that's just my ethics right now. Like, why would I keep food from people because they're free, right? I don't care. There's enough food to go around. I can only eat so much of it. So I'm actually, as much as possible, trying to adapt away from money and charging for things. And I don't know what it's going to look like. It's kind of scary. But it's to me, the more that we keep talking about incentives in a money way, the more we're reinforcing a mindset. And, I, you know, I, I'm... You know, you were like saying about my mom doing something and I was like, Beth, I'm like, you know, I could be your mom, right? I'm an older generation. I've been brainwashed a lot longer. Um, but I'm really trying to unbrainwash myself from a transactional mindset. That's what I'm adapting away from. Um, yeah, so I have I have to close up in just a minute. Um, as uh, But yeah, thank you so much for that perspective. And I think that, you know, there's in particular a... Um, alignment with um you know using source cred and um you know if you have you you can take more time we have about 20 minutes till the next talk so feel free to continue okay i mean if people are down to continue this discussion i think that um you know it has <laughs> uh, gone to a point that i think um is an interesting convergence um in terms of uh, you know, Grace bringing up about um, wanting explicit incentive structures that are not necessarily um, tied to, uh, you know, defining, you know, unit of task equals unit of money, you know, interacts in a system in a certain way. And, you know, so that's maybe not what I said. I didn't even talk about incentive. I think any incentive system distorts human behavior. Um, okay, I think that might be outside the scope of this particular discussion, um, but what I was trying to get at to draw those two parts together is, um, you know, it might be useful to think about how the objective that you are um, working toward uh, ends up, you know, potentially correlating well with source cred. So um, for those, you know, who have had an experience with using source cred, it could be interesting to talk briefly about, um, you know, if uh that provides a certain solution because i know at different times you know of me looking into attribution networks and being very excited about source cred but i haven't actually used it that much yet since it's been you know kind of developing in um tandem to uh us developing this ecosystem and these networks in the first place like you know what grace has been bringing up i know is a discussion that a lot of us you know with grace and in general have been having over this past year about um you know, contributions that, um, you know, we might not want to, um, like, mathematicize or metricize, um, and, you know, sort of being a possible solution for that. So maybe, you know, if anyone would be down to speak to your experience with that as, you know, a particular mode of adapting that could answer some of these hard questions. Um, maybe I can ask back, Grace, because of course, um, I agree that any incentive is distorting human behavior, but you have that, whether you design it or whether it's just there and it's emerging, right? So, um, I mean, what you describe that you, on one hand, you don't charge anything for, let, let's say, a, a common good as you perceive it in a certain space, and on the other hand, live from pretty, let's say, regular commercial work. I mean, is that your proposal to aim for, or what is it? So I would say that if we think about 
the system we're in, right? I have children, right? <laughs> like I have a family, I have rent, right? And I need to handle that. Mm -hmm. But even so, if I think about, let's say, let, let, I'm just gonna think about the most simple thing, right? I, my children have a college fund, it's all in US dollars. And I don't know if it's gonna be worth anything by the time they get to college. Mm -hmm. Like it might completely disappear. My daughter is 21 now and she can't take her SATs because, you know, virus. And my son has three more years in the Navy before he can start thinking about that. Will they have any money whatsoever? So why would I be spending money chasing, spending any time chasing money, which is going to become worthless, right? Uh, so that's like kind of helps me psychologically. So but I think that we all have one foot in the existing system. You can't just walk out of the existing system and say, I'm done if you have any kind of family, right? If I didn't have a family, maybe I would be like, you know what, I'm gonna get a tent and a sleeping bag and I'm gonna live from people's donations and, and screw it, right? Um, so I'm trying to keep one foot in this crumbling system, but trying to put as much of my body and heart into a system that I think has more potential. And that may mean as soon as this virus is over, looking for um, like an agricultural cooperative to live in. It may be learning about how to build my own electrical systems. It is about, I mean, I have a hollow host in here. I have my own hosting network in my living room. It's about separating myself from that system as much as I can and as fast as I can. And maybe I can afford to do that faster than some people because my incoming work from the old world is pretty good and my cost of living is low. I also moved to Slovenia, so I have a lower cost of living than I had in some other place, you know, Israel, I'm Israeli. But the, so I'm trying to keep my health from drowning as, you know, because part of me is on, on the boat, like we're on a boat, we're on a sinking ship. So I'm trying to keep the ship, you know, I don't want to drown, I want to jump right off but I'm trying to build a new land. So it's a, it's a balance, it's a delicate balance. But, and, then, and then when I think about funding my project, so one of the things I've been doing is I started creating ideas around, oh, how do I get young people involved as a student project? How do I get like girls who code to code this instead of looking for money, looking at it as an internship? How can I, how can I fund this without money? How can I get the resources instead of the money? to do the things I want to do. So that's where I've been trying to, because because for several years I've been looking for money to fund my project. Now I'm like, how do I find resources? How do I redefine what I need so it's not all about money? That's that's where I am. Can, can I uh, yeah. comment on this? Yeah, I think it's great because uh, mm, like having some batteries or like you said, electrical systems, try, <coughs> trying to get a little bit isolated so <coughs> If everything really starts falling apart, it probably won't, but it it won't because people will be self-sufficient and then it's self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If you have some, uh, if your home is safe relatively, it's not too interconnected with everything with the system, then this is uh, the real decentralization also. So if more people think about not just going virtually into, I don't know, into the internet and living there, just try to also make your internet safe so if uh, something breaks you have a uh, battery some uh, and, on, and focus on local networks to have data in your in your home server and then internet can fail for a few days you know why not and you you can uh, have most of your useful data and interesting and leisure stuff also on your server this is what i've, I've been see here for example mm, this is a raspberry pi is behind and it has, uh, it gets music from our home server. So it's in also in this direction. So I'm glad uh, you mentioned this. And I also want to say something else. Yeah, where to get resources. Um, things are cheap in this regard, uh, cheaper than before because Raspberry Pi costed like this type of computer 20 years ago was 2000 euros or 10 years ago when we were starting. We had desktop PC and now this is the same power and cost 30 euros, you know. And you need you can get uh, something useful for 100 or 200 euros, and uh, it goes a long way. So um, the resources are uh, easy. It's everything is cheaper, but you still have to get something somewhere, and uh, the money will not completely go away. But um, 
the, the old system um, and I don't agree completely that it's a sinking ship it's it it will like fiat has to exist because as economy grows they have to have emergency uh, like levers like in this situation they will just print and you cannot print crypto but somebody has to print uh, money because people need to get some uh, money handed over you know now so I think it won't go away but uh, it will get combined and there will be alternatives and it will be more dynamic and at least we'll have alternatives and so that's it yeah. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd also like to react briefly, Andres. So, I mean, what you're trying to achieve is kind of um, an, on an individual level finding solutions for yourself, and, and that's great. And I hope that many more people, um, like the second speaker, I unfortunately don't know your name, but you're also trying to find an, an, a solution for yourself. But at the same time, I really, I appreciate that people are trying to find solutions on a systemic level. So how can we solve it for the future for many more, not just looking at an individual situation? And I think that um, I consider when I'm talking incentives, you are totally right. So if you're just focusing on money, like we looked at it um, like in the traditional system, um, I think we are missing out a, a chance, but we need still a, a means of exchange, right? And also to, to um, honor and help people to add value. And this value can be defined by ourselves and by our communities. And it could be a new kind of value, not only it can be funding because it sometimes is necessary. It can be all kinds of other value contributions. And here, I think we should take a look at incentives, nevertheless being aware that it's distracting human behavior. But um, I think we can't get entirely rid of it. Or my view on it, they are incentives are there. They are always there. It's just uh, the question is how we design them. Yeah. And, um, you know, how they are measured and what they are units of, which is kind of what I was getting at. So, you know, for example, um, you know, with token engineering, you know, what is the uh, incentives that we have for participating in token engineering? You know, I know for me, it's, you know, getting to meet some amazing people and have conversations that I enjoy. It's, um, you know, finding people to collaborate with, like expanding the possibility space of stuff that we are working on. Um, you know, all of those things are not necessarily, you know, financial incentives, but still, you know, in terms of, in, uh, I guess this nuance that I think is very challenging right now, which which is um, so many of these kind of interpersonal incentives, you know, incentives in the layer of social capital and human capital that, um, you know, are often, you know, maybe they're adjacent to money or maybe they're completely divorced from money and all about, um, you know, interpersonal interactions. But um, especially, you know, right now in kind of this time where we are like, you know, forced to go remotely and be much more, you know, just distributed and decentralized like I think that these incentives that are not explicitly financial end up um, being what is getting hurt really hard and especially you know as you can kind of see from you know what are the kind of jobs that are being threatened you know people you know who are uh, organizing you know events like um, managing communities like the you know the thing that is the most uh quickly taken away and that falls apart are you know these um like support networks and ways of gathering that are focused in physical space and then it becomes very hard um you know to incentivize people to join and maintain communities and you know to incentivize external parties to um see a tangible result of like this gathering and these um kind of human architectures to be something that they want to fund and i know you know in terms of you know these uh this kind of fine line that we're walking now where it's like, you know, yes, all of us are very interested in exploring systems of incentives that um, are focused more on resource sharing and, um, 
you know, resource exchange and not, you know, as purely transactional or mercenary or like focused on money. And yet those can exist without the foundational layer of resources. And, you know, it's a paradox we were experiencing before, but now with the inability to gather physically or know when we'll be able to gather physically, and especially something that's terrifying to me, like the fact, you know, when we are released from, you know, this quarantine time period, like will the, um, you know, spaces that we're able to gather and physically, like, well, you know, whether it's, um, you know, for artistic and creative and musical events or, you know, for um, coming together in collective space, you know, like uh, when we have token engineering meetings, for example, like, you know, at Super when we had a supermarket, for example, I mean, will a lot of those kind of collective gathering places even still be there to act as a foundation for our networks? And so, you know, we need to have, you know, now be accounting for that as well and figuring out these like funding models and incentive models. So, you know, this uh, line between, you know, having an opportunity from like manifesting a new future with um, more like care focused resource exchange infrastructures while also, you know, losing access to a lot of those that were already kind of precarious in the first place. Um, yeah, anyways, I'm just curious to hear from, you know, all or any of you, like what your perspective has been on this and, you know, maybe a more optimistic take than my fears. <laughs> I would ask if you think that it would make sense for some of these spaces to become more like a commons. Like that would be my question to you. I mean, I think a lot of them are a commons. I think as many of them are as a, co a commons as people are able to have access to. Like I know that, you know, when I'm speaking about this, I'm referring to either places that are a commons or dream of becoming a commons, you know, like something that, you know, is owned by, you know, a group of people or is available as a commons. And so, you know, my fear is that those are the ones that will fall away because of having, so few resources and, um, you know, without the foundation of a physical space or without the foundation of people who are able to make a livelihood um, sustaining them, that, you know, that is what we'll lose and what we need to be actively adapting for, um, you know, in this transitional time, so. Yeah. 